When we are attached to God's righteous guy, we call upon the name of the Lord and are saved. This is Genesis in five. Genesis is the story of creation, God's creation of his people. Even though his people fall away from him, God continues to recreate a people for himself. And he does this through one righteous man. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Joseph. And those who are attached to that one righteous man are God's people. God's people call upon the name of the Lord. And those who are not his people call upon their own names. This contrast begins immediately in Genesis. After sin enters the world, Cain kills Abel. And then Cain builds a city and names it after his son. Cain is the father of unbelievers, and he has his own son's name glorified. Seth, Adam and Eve's son, who replaces Abel, is the father of believers. At the time his son was born, people began to call upon the name of the Lord, as do all who belong to the Lord. As sin takes over, God recreates again and again. In Genesis, he does so with one righteous guy. Everyone who is attached to that righteous guy is blessed because of the righteous guy. It starts with Noah, then the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then, after Jacob, the patriarchs are Jacob's twelve sons, who are the founding fathers of the tribe of Israel. These righteous guys call upon God's name and worship him and long to live in his promised land. People who are defined by their sin build cities and call upon their own name. As with Cain, this contrast can be seen in Genesis 11, in the story of the Tower of Babel. The people build a tower in order to make a name for themselves. Beginning in chapter 12, God creates a people for himself through Abraham, the man who believes in God's promises. Abraham is the father of God's people. He is the patriarch of patriarchs. He is God's righteous man who is righteous, not because of his works, but because of his faith. And God's promises come through his son. This brings us to the bulk of Genesis, the history of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the patriarchs that call upon the name of the Lord, build altars, and seek to live in the promised land. We see this in Genesis 12, 7 through 8 with Abraham, in 26, 25 with Isaac, and then in chapter 35 with Jacob. It is in the account of Abraham that we learn that building an altar to the Lord means you trust him. It means you trust his word and his promises. Nowhere is this more clearly seen than when God asks Abraham to build him an altar and sacrifice his promised son Isaac on it. The book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham trusted God's promise so completely that he believed God would even raise Isaac from the dead. And yet, God's righteous guys are fatally flawed. They don't always trust God's word and believe his promises. After building his altar, Noah gets drunk and passes out. Abraham gives away his wife to another man to save his own life twice. And then he attempts to fulfill God's promise of a son on his own with his wife's handmaid. Jacob is a liar and a thief, and the list of sin goes on. Genesis teaches us that we need to be attached to God's righteous guy to be saved. But it also teaches us that these men are not the righteous guy. There is another coming. And it is this coming that is promised. Now let's go back to the beginning of Genesis. In chapter 3, the devil, the serpent, tempts Adam and Eve to follow a different word than God's word. To turn away from what God said. Throughout the story of Genesis and throughout scripture, we see people tempted to follow a different word. To not trust in what God says, but to trust in their circumstances. But God made a promise. A promise that is believed through all Genesis. From Adam, his first righteous guy, one would come to save all. One perfect righteous guy. Without sin, without flaw, the very definition of righteousness. Here, Genesis points us forward to the New Testament. To see that Jesus is the righteous guy. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we learn that there is no other name given under heaven by which man is saved. And in Philippians 2, we learn that Jesus is given the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Romans 10, 13 tells us that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Here, Paul quotes the prophet Joel. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, quoted the same prophecy. This began back in Genesis 4, where people began to call on the name of the Lord, and it's all fulfilled in Jesus. 
We are attached to God's righteous one. We call upon the name of the Lord. His name is Jesus. And that's a promise you can trust. That is Genesis in 5. Read it, learn it, and pass it on.